reaction rates. There's just a few things I'd like to make sure you understand before you take your quiz. Uh, starting with uh, these beautiful graphs right here. You might recall them from our thermodynamics unit. Remember, exothermic starts high and ends low, and endothermic starts low and ends high. You need to know about the activation energy because you're going to learn, or you did learn, about um, a catalyst. And catalysts, what they do is they actually lower this activation energy so the hump isn't so big so that the reaction can happen faster. Okay? So those are important in case you forgot about those. And then on number six, where you're calculating the rate, remember that rate is the change in concentration over the change in time. And since concentration is molarity or moles per liter, you can actually use the balanced chemical equation to go from one substance to another substance and find the rate. So in other words, um, the average rate of reaction, you could calculate the rate of reaction for hydrogen. And then since hydrogen, you just need to balance this guy, this equation, it's a 1, 1, 2, so there should be a 2 in front of there. Since it's a 1 to 2 ratio, you can set it up just like dimensional analysis. Okay? So those are the big things. Um, oh, and then of course, how do you speed up the rate of a reaction? Um, those five things are excellent when we're speeding up rates of reaction, and um, they will help you in a future lab. All right, so let's go over the questions. Those are the ones that we haven't done yet. Okay, so... Why is it necessary for, a mole for molecules to collide in order to react? Well, if they don't hit one another, no reaction can occur because they can't break their bonds and they can't switch atoms. So it's very important that um, molecules collide. What has to happen to chemical bonds before a reaction can take place? So this is what um, I was talking about with activation energy. Activation energy is the energy needed to force um, bonds to make and break, okay? So what has to happen before bonds can, um, can react? They have to break. They have to achieve enough activation energy that they can break those bonds and create new things. All right, so for number two, draw the lewis dopp structure for carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. You guys learned this way back in unit four, so I'm going to do a little refresher course. When drawing a Lewis dot structure, you must count up the valence electrons. So carbon has four, I found that on the periodic table, and oxygen has six. Therefore, I should have 10 total valence electrons in my bonding. I write the first one, unless it's hydrogen, in the middle. I connect it to the second one. And then I start counting dots. So in each bond, there are two dots, two electrons. Okay, so we have 2, 4, 6, 8, and then 10. And I only put um, electrons on the middle atom or the first atom if uh, the outer atoms are full. All right, so now I check for stability. Carbon only has 4 electrons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these electrons and I'm going to move them so that I create another bond. So these electrons are now here, and therefore uh, carbon has six, so therefore oxygen needs to share another lone pair. So those guys are gonna move there, and you get carbon monoxide, okay? So there we have it, carbon monoxide. Uh, nitrogen dioxide works the same way. Uh, for time purposes. I'm not going to draw it all out, but if you add all their um, uh, sorry, electrons together, you're going to find out that oxygen and nitrogen are going to create a bond. It's going to look like this. Nitrogen has one electron. That's not very um, usual. Usually we do electrons in pairs. Um, however, this one is one of the exceptions. So now I have both Lewis dot structures. Whenever, um, okay, uh, note the positive and negative regions. In order to do that, I need to remember that the more electronegative my atom is, 
the more uh, negative it is. So since oxygen is closer to fluorine, he has a slightly negative charge. And it's the same thing here. Oxygen is closer to fluorine than nitrogen. So they're going to have a slightly negative charge. And if the oxygens are pulling the electrons away, that means that nitrogen and carbon become positive. All right. And even though nitrogen and carbon both have um, some electrons on them, the electron density oxygen is going to be pulling those electrons down farther. So at the very tippity top, you do have some um, positive delta charge. Okay. All right. Number three. How are the orientations of carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide molecules not correct to start a reaction? Well, if I think about a magnet, um, I know that positives repel, negatives repel, but a positive and a negative attract. So if I have a carbon monoxide headed towards a nitrogen dioxide gas, I'm going to have a positive going towards a negative, and so therefore when they, they'll hit, they will, they will actually collide, okay? And if they have enough energy, they can break the bonds and start reacting. But if I have it the other way, there we go, then I have two negatives going towards each other. And if two negatives are going towards each other, then they will repel. So when we're talking about orientation um, in space, we're talking about how each molecule has a positive and a negative force, okay? And if the positives are coming together, they're going to repel and break apart. They won't collide unless they have a super amount of energy and are forced to. But then again, they won't like each other, so then they'll break apart. Um, if the negatives are, if they're both negative, you have the same result. But if you have a positive and a negative, Oh, 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 yes. If you have a positive or a negative, then um, they actually attract one another and they are able to um, hit, collide, and react if they have enough activation energy. So that's what number three means. All right, so for number four, if I have carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide and I increase the concentration of the carbon monoxide, what would happen to the rate, or what would happen to the um, ability to create collisions? Well, the rate or collisions would have to increase because if there is more carbon monoxide, then there's more chance that they are going to hit a nitrogen dioxide. It's just like um, if you're playing dodgeball. If you're just throwing one ball across the line, it's not very likely that you're going to hit and collide. But if everybody has a ball and you have 50 balls thrown across the line, most likely you're going to hit someone and hit more people than before. All right? So that is why if you decrease the concentration, like if you decrease the number of balls, your rate will also decrease. All right. Uh, in a reaction that's... Oh, okay. So we've got iron powder... We've got iron powder and um, oxygen gas. So since iron is a uh, solid, okay, and oxygen is a gas, so he's floating around, oxygen can really only get to the outside of the iron powder. So if we pulverize it, like it says here, and break this guy up into many, 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 many pieces, Oxygen can now get to here, it can get in here, it can get all into the crevices and everything like that. And so by increasing the surface area and by breaking those apart, you increase the reaction rate because they're more likely to collide. All right. Um, and then why is that better than a solid block? Well, a solid block, you can only get to the outside. Okay. So what you want to do whenever you want to increase the rate of a reaction, it's uh, that collision theory. You want to increase collisions um, and you want to have the correct activation energy. 
So by breaking this guy up, you are increasing the collisions, which makes it possible to have better reaction. All right. How would increasing temperature affect the, um, the occurrence of a reaction? So they don't give us an actual uh, example on this one. But if I have two substances, okay, and both are moving very slowly, blah, 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 okay, they're not going to hit each other. Most likely they'll go past each other. They won't even get to each other. It's very hard. So as temperature is decreased, they move slower, and so therefore they can't hit each other as much. And if they do hit, they don't have enough energy to actually break the bonds. They can just kind of like bounce off each other and go their separate ways, okay? But if I increase the temperature, then not only do my molecules have enough energy to break those bonds so that they can start a reaction, but they also have enough energy to collide more times. So um, hopefully more collisions means more chance of them actually hitting in the correct orientation. So temperature is a wonderful one. It works for both of our collision theory principles. All right, last one. All right, so for energy diagrams, you guys learned how to draw these last unit. Reaction time goes on bottom, energy goes on the side. Here I have an endothermic reaction and an exothermic reaction. And a catalyst, so if I look, my activation energy always goes from the top to the initial. So this is my activation energy. Now, the thing about a catalyst is catalysts orient uh, molecules in space so that they don't need as much energy in order to react. So everything stays the same. It's going to stay the same down here. It's going to come up, but then it doesn't quite need as much, and it comes down like that. Okay. Uh, for an exothermic, it looks pretty much the same. Everything stays the same, except for the hump is a little lower. Which means that the activation energy has decreased, and it is easier to react and get a reaction going. All right. Please let me know if you have any questions, and um, good luck on your quiz.